Good morning. Welcome to Manna from Heaven with your girl Sharon Gaines Lee. I am so glad you joined me again. Again, I am excited. I'm always excited, excited about working together with God. God, when He wants to, it's just exciting to me that He wants to work with us and talk to us, and He loves us so much. That's ex that's the exciting part. But I'm so excited about this topic, topic, listening to the voice of God, hearing God's voice. And we want to be laser sharp. We want to grow in that. We don't ever want to get to a place where, where I hear the voice of God or, you know, you know how we can be, how our flesh is, how it can be. And so to this morning, we're going to talk about listening to the voice of God and the importance of it. And we want to get as we grow in God's grace and mercy and his loving kindness we want to get keener we want to be like sniper sharp in listening to the voice of the Lord now sometimes we're going to hit and miss that's a part of learning that's a part of learning it and we don't have to cover that up we just need to go back in and say God well how are you maneuvering me here what do you want me to hear so today just listen closely listen closely and let's work together with what God is doing today are you ready I am. Father God, We, th I thank you for your audience. I thank you for using my mouth, Father. I thank you for speaking to us. You said where two or more are gathered in your name, that you are in the midst. So Father, we thank you that you are in the midst right now, ready to give us the next step that we're to go to. I'm excited for you, Father. Thank you for choosing us, Father. We didn't choose you. You chose us. You came after us. And so today, Father, we thank you for working together with us in the name of Jesus. Are you ready? We were born with the ability to hear God's voice. We were born. That was, that was innate. We say God told me this and God told me that. What really, what's, what, what's really the purpose of God speaking to us and us hearing him? He can write it down. He could have just written it down. He didn't have to speak to us. And he could have been done with us. He could have been done with it. But he wanted to have communion with us. That's how much God loves us. Then I hear, you know, sometimes we hear people saying or we say it ourselves that we hear God speaking to us. And, and so I can remember initially um, when I went away to college, I'll just tell you this briefly. When I went away to college, I didn't know about God could speak to you and you can hear the voice of God. I didn't hear that. That was introduced to me at the fellowship I went to when I was in college. And that was like, God has a mouth, he speaks to us. And that was that was fascinating to me. So, sorry, just had to get a drink of water. And so that was fascinating to me. And it was scripture to back it up because that's what you always want. You don't want to just hear a theory, a new theory because it's new, because sometimes we like the new weird stuff. <laughs> and I didn't want it to be new weird stuff. I wanted, to be, wanted it to be what the word of the Lord was. Well, just to make a long story short in this, once I heard that God could speak to us and we could hear his voice, that so fascinated me. And so, I mean, and it was really good. So I was a part of a fellowship there, but before I was committed to a fellowship in um, where I was, it was on a campus. Um, a couple of students got together because we um, went to this church and we heard and the, and the gospel was preached about hearing God's voice. So it fascinated all of us. So we would get together and we would pray and we would have Bible study and it was exciting and we would listen to the voice of the Lord and trying to hone in to what God was saying. But we didn't have a covering. So it was just, it was us taking the word, doing it. So at some point it got out of control because now you're dealing with the flesh and you're dealing with the will of man. So you have that and the voice of God and the power of God in our midst. If it's not directed, it can be out of hand because it can be, you can make it all about you and all about you hearing the voice of the Lord and all about you saying, I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the verse, voice of the Lord um, more than you did. So it could just go back and forth and you know what I mean. So to be taught about the word of the Lord and, and, and to have God's covering over us is important. So that's what we're going to sort of touch on today because there's a human element and there's a human will about hearing the, the voice of the Lord and all of that can affect us hearing the word hearing the voice of the Lord because if our will is so involved in it then we're hearing the work the um the um, voice of the Lord the way that we want to hear it you know, if our will, our will, not God's will concerning us, but if our will is paramount, is at the top, then it will adjust what we're hearing. 
And so that's important. And many times, not just me, it's happened to you too because that's a part of the process. And it can still be happening now, and it is from time to time. That's why we need God. We need um, a Savior for the rest of our life. So how can we intensify our prayer and our hearing life? Well, here we go. Get alone. Sometimes we have to get alone with God and put on, sometimes I know I'll put on worship music because I just want my insides to quiet down and know that prayer is an exchange of a burden. Prayer is an exchange of a burden. There's a song we used to sing, and I know you probably know it too, and it says, I'm trading my sorrow, I'm, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm trading my joy for the for the I'm I'm trading my pain for the joy of the Lord and then it goes yes Lord yes Lord you're 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 humbling yourself under God's voice under his you know under his will and you're saying yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord yes yes Lord amen it is so and that's a worship song but that's the truth that's the truth. That's the word. I mean, this worship song was taken out of the Bible because we want the will of the Lord, whether we want, want it or not. I mean, we have to come into working together with the Lord. So the will of the Lord is more paramount than our will, because our will is not going to take us but so far. It's not going to take us, but God's will would, will take us, you know, where we need to go. Otherwise, you're just complaining and, and griping if we, if, we, if we don't do it God's way. If we want our prayers answered, we must be specific in our requests. Be clear on what you're asking for. The need to be precise in our prayer requests is clearly illustrated in the account of the two blind men in Matthew 20, in, in Matthew 20, specifically, specifically, excuse me, in verses 30 through 34. But we're going to cover um, the entire verse. It says, now listen to me, listen to me. And this is Matthew um, 20. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a state who went out in the morning at dawn to hire workmen for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, which was about 9 o'clock a.m., and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right and appropriate wage. And they went. He went out about the sixth hour, which was about noon, and the ninth hour, which was about three o'clock, and did the same thing. And about the 11th hour, which is later about five o'clock, 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They answered him because no one hired us. He told, he told them, you go into the vineyard also. You go into the vineyard also. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, beginning with the last to be hired and ending with the first to be hired. Those who had been hired at the 11th hour, which was about 5 o'clock p.m., came and retired and received, I'm sorry, and received a denarius each, a day's wage. Now, when the first to be hired came, they thought they would get more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they protested. Here comes this flash. They protested and grumbled at the owner of the estate, saying, these men who came last worked only one hour, and yet you have made them equal in wages to us who have carried most of all the burden and burden and worked in the scorching heat all day long. But the owner of the estate replied to one of them, "Friend, I am doing you. I, am I doing you an injustice? Do you not agree with me? Did you not agree with me for Daenerys?" Take what belongs to you and go. But I chose to give to this last man hired the same as I gave you. Am I not lawfully permitted to do what I choose with what is mine? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So those who are last in this world, listen to this. So those who are last in this world shall be first in the world to come. 
and those who are first shall be last. Let me read that again, and I'll tell you why I'm reading it again. So those who are last in this world shall be first in the world to come, and those who are last and those who are first will be last. Because we say, and I want to pause right here, because we say, we say quickly sometimes this place is not our home. And it's not. We are sojourners through this place. But let me take it a little step further. Because this place is tangible to us. We, you know, this is where we live. This is where we raise our family. This is where we have a job. This is where we do everything. But let me tell you, this is the boot camp for what's to come. This place is truly not our home. This is the ground where we're being trained to live in heaven. This is the place where we're being trained to live in heaven. Now listen to this because you're going to hear some more. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and along the way he said to them, listen carefully, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin Jewish high court, and they will, um, they will um, condemn him and sentence him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, Roman authorities, to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And he will be raised to life on the third day. Then Salome, the mother of Zebedee's children, children, James and John, came up to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down in respect, Ask a favor of him. And he said to her, and he said to her, what do you wish? She answered him, command that in your kingdom, listen, listen, she knew a little something, but she shifted it. Her flesh did. What do you wish? Jesus asked her. She answered him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit in a position of honor and authority, one on your right and one on your left side. But Jesus replied, I'm sorry, but Jesus replied, you do not realize that what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup of suffering that I am about to drink? They answered, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup of suffering, but to sit on my right and my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for, for those whom have been seen prepared by my father. And when the other 10 heard this, they were resentful and angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles have absolute power and lord it and lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. Mm -hmm. It is not the way amongst you. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become Great among you shall be your servant. Hmm. Listen to that. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your willing and humble slave. Just as the Son of Man will not come to be served, but to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for the many, paying the price to set them free from the penalty of sin. Listen to this. This is preparation because we, I know we say we don't, this place is not our home, but we're being prepared here to live in another place. So how we live here will affect how we, how, how we live, how we, in, in, in heaven. We are, be, this is our boot camp. This is our boot camp. We have it reversed. We think it is a bad place to go to heaven. You know, I, I mean, you know, and God has everything. He's dotted every I and crossed every T. But this place is truly not our home. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. And the two men, the two blind men were sitting by the road. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David, the Messiah. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet. But they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, the Messiah, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them and asked, what do you want me to do for you? They answered him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Move with compassion, moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and he immediately they regained their sight and followed him as his disciples. Sheep are born with the ability to hear. 
We are born with the ability to hear. Being taught to hear more precisely and accurately can be taught. Can be taught. When in your private time with the Lord, write down what you think God is saying to you in the scripture. Write it down because God watches over his word to perform his word. And if it's important enough to you, if it's important enough to you to write down, God will watch over it and perform it. So write down what you, excuse me, write down what God is saying to you in the scriptures. An exegesis, which is the Greek, and it means the critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially of scripture, to draw up and out. To draw up, like in a well, to draw up and out like you draw water out of a well. Because the meaning can be historical, it can be contextual, or literal revelation. Listen to this. Listen, when we're listening to the voice of the Lord, because the meaning of it can be historical, it can be contextual, or it can, it can be a literal revelation. The Holy Spirit says, Jesus is alive. So what are you going to say to me, Lord? Jesus is alive. So what do we say, say about that? Because Jesus, in training us while we're here on this earth, he wants precision. He's making us more precise, more and more. And so we want to we wanna have our ears open to hear his voice. And it's okay to make mistakes, but it's, it's more okay, if, that's, if I can say it that way, to acknowledge that we made a mistake so that God can train us. Because train, you know, if you're being trained for something, you don't hit everything right the first time. So we're in training here. We're in training to live in heaven. We want to be trained with precision to hear the voice of the Lord. We are innately born to hear God's voice. We sometimes call it common sense. We learn, we, you know, we call it common, common sense because we learn not to put our hand on the fire or we learn not to walk on glass. There are things we learn. But then we have to mature. That's the same way when we hear the, verse of the, the voice of the Lord. There are certain things in the beginning we learn, but then there's a maturity that takes place as we go on. For example, children learn to speak, but they must learn little, little by little to master the language and to learn what to and what not to say. And you know children, why do children will say things like, why does that lady have so many lines in her face? Or how old are you, grandma? We don't ask grandma how old she is at all because all, all we know that, that grandma was around when Noah and Abraham was alive. I mean, that's only a joke, I'm only kidding. The ability to hear God is innate, but we must mature in the gift. We learn how to function, what to say, what not to say, because sometimes we say, oh, I, God said this to me. Oh, God didn't say, oh, I heard the Lord first of the Lord. I, and we make it so commonplace that it becomes neutral. And, and, and we don't hear it anymore. We don't hear it or we don't believe it anymore. We hold on to a form of godliness, but knowing that the voice of the Lord can be precise and clear and sniper sharp, we sort of quietly walk away from that. And not knowing that we are in training. We are in training for heaven. We are in training here. Uh, there's a word that says a minute. All the time God wants to communicate with us. Message a minute. All the time, God wants us to communicate. God wants to communicate with us. Do you want to explain the the same thing to your adult child that you had to explain to him when he was four? No. There are time in being trained. God trains us in certain things, but there are certain things that God shouldn't have to say to us over and over again because we're being trained and we're being learned. We're learning what to say, what to function, how to move to the right, how to move to the left. He's training us in this thing. So don't think, don't presume, don't presume, especially if you've been in this thing 20 years, 30 years. Oh yeah, because God spoke to you and it was clear one time that I always hear the, the voice of the Lord and it's always correct. No, it's not. That's why you hear people saying all the time, time you have to validate yourself by saying the Lord spoke to me. The Lord said this. The Lord told me to drink that water. The Lord told me to go here. The Lord, you know, it's the Lord. And we make it commonplace as though God really doesn't speak. But if we say God told us a hundred times, at least we can be right two times. That's how we, how we function, how we think the voice of the Lord is not clear. And God wants us to be laser sharp. He doesn't want to us to be like that. He doesn't want us to function like a four-year-old when we're 40. 
Hear, oh, now listen to this. Hear, oh, hear my people, and I will admonish you. And, and this is in Psalms 81, 8. Hear, oh, hear my people, and I will admonish you. Oh, Israel, if you will listen to me. One of the most important lessons we can learn is how to listen to God. If our complex and hectic lives, through our complex and hectic lives, nothing is more urgent, nothing more necessary, and nothing more rewarding than hearing what God has to say to us and obeying him. A true conversation, of course, involves both talking and listening. And in James 1.19, understand this, it says, brothers and sisters, let everyone be quick to hear. Why? Because we're slow to hear. Be careful through through thought be careful thoughtful listeners slow to speak why because we're quick to speak a speaker of carefully chosen words and slow to anger patient reflective because we, and he put he throws it, it, he throws slow to anger there because we don't like to be wrong and so i'm going to get upset about it if i'm if i'm you know you know that whole thing how the flesh is so i'm, I'm not going to labor that because i want to keep going but but um, God says be, to be slow to speak, quick to hear, a speaker of carefully chosen words and slow to anger, patient, reflective, and forgiving. Most of us do better with the talking part, don't we? Throughout the Bible, we read of prophets and other men and women of God who employ, the, who employ their people to hear the word of the Lord. Obviously, God earnestly wants us to to hear his voice. Guess what? He still does. He wants us to hear his voice today. He wanted them to hear th then and he wants us to hear it now. We, we didn't come up with that to hearing the voice of the Lord. God orchestrated that. So how do we go about hearing his voice? What steps can we take to make ourselves ready to hear what he has to say? Let's read God's word. Let's start with that by studying God's word. We begin to see his established order in our lives. Lives. We learn about his truth. We learn about his mercy, his grace, his love, and his forgiveness through studying the word. Seek him in prayer. Let's seek him. Let's go into his presence and seek him and ask questions. Not be afraid to go into his presence. He wants us to come in. This is where we find out our ways aren't always his ways. Getting married, like sometimes we take on the world's philosophy with getting married. We have to be married at a certain time. We have all of that in, in you know, a worldly perception, perception of what God has given us. And God, and some of those things need to be, it, it needs to be addressed. How we love. Sometimes we don't love the way that God loves. Sometimes our desires Sometimes our desires are different from his desires. So the prophet Habakkuk thought the, thought the same thing, and I've talked about Habakkuk before, but he thought things should be, he was doing things, he studied the word, he did things the way to God, so he thought certain things should have taken place on this stage in history the way they should have taken place. But then he realized at some point that God's ways are higher than his ways. And and, and we find that out from time to time. The way that we're accustomed to doing things, the way that we're accustomed of saying things, the way we're accustomed to handling people or handling the word, it has to be adjusted from time to time. And, and, and we're not to get angry about that. We're not. We need one another. We need one another because sometimes we need to be adjusted by God. And guess who God uses? He uses one another. Many times bowing our heads or falling to our knees is the best way to see God's face and to hear his voice. In opening ourselves up to him in prayer, we can tell him all that we are feeling and all that we are experiencing. Prayer is more than just a wish list for God's... <laughs> For God, it's a conversation in which we interact with him. Let's meditate on the truth. Let's meditate on it. Meditate. God says meditate on my word day and night. What is he saying? He's not saying to just hold the Bible up to your face. You know, all day you walk around looking like a nut with the Bible. You're in the grocery store in the Bible. No, but we the meditating on it means that you chew on it all the time. You don't need it. You read it. You spend time with the Lord so you know what the word says and you chew on it. When you encounter situation, that word that you're 
chewing on, you implement it by the word. You don't just read the word and then you close it up and then you go on with your life. No, you're reading the word and now you're meditating on the word because you're going to implement that word in every, every facet of your life. You're going to incorporate it because this is, again, this is the boot camp for us. This is, this is where we learn to work together with God. If you don't like worship here, you're not going to like worship in heaven. This is where God trains us in righteousness. He trains us. I know we want to make, we say this place is not our home, but it really is sometimes to us. And God is adjusting that. He's making it more so that we're seeing his truth and not our truth. And we need that. That's why we have questions and we get mad and angry about certain things because we don't have the truth about it. God doesn't condemn us with that, but he says, come, because if you don't understand something, God wants to make us understand it understand things. So we meditate, we meditate on his truth, dwelling on what God speaks to our hearts is a great way to let his truth take root in our souls. Not only will what we read and hear from him impact our lives, but by meditating on it, God has the, God has the building materials to lay an unshakable foundation in our lives and heart. Yeah. The psalmist said to the Lord, I have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditations in Psalms 119.99. Be still before the Lord in prayer. Many people seem uncomfortable with silence, especially if they're alone. In silence, however, we are able to hear the still small voice of God. And that's in Kings. You can read that about that in Kings chapter 19, verse 12, the voice of the Lord. uh, It talks about the voice of the Lord. Quietness is essential to listening. Quietness is is essential to listening. If we are too busy to sit in silence in God's presence, if we are always preoccupied with thoughts or concerns about the day, about the day, if we have filled our minds for for hours with carnal crap interference and aimless chatter then we are going to have difficulty listening to his still small voice at the excuse at the at, at some point during your day be still before the lord in prayer be still and quiet let god talk sometimes it's okay to shut your mouth and listen to the still voice of god speaking to us listen to him You hear with your ears. If you have normal hearing, you can't help hearing sounds within a certain audio range. Listening, however, goes further involving the mind. Listening, however, goes further involving the mind. Genuine listening is is active, meaning that it puts the mind in gear and plays attention to every everything said. Listen to that. Genuine listening is active me is active, meaning that it puts the mind in gear and plays attention to everything said, looking intently for the meaning. Listening, listen, looking intently for the meaning. You can't talk and listen intently for the meaning at the same time. You're doing one or the other. That's how God wants us to listen to him actively actively involved with him. You can be quiet and actively involved with what God is saying. We think actively involved means being a busybody, and it doesn't mean that. This is called the quiet time with God. Now listen to this. This is good stuff too. I hope you're loving this because I'm loving it. And listen to this. God is pleased with me and you. He is pleased with me and you. God planned for me and you to 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 please him. God planned for me and for you to be, to, to give him pleasure. God is love. He made me and you in his pleasure, in his image. I'm sorry. God made me, me and you to love him. He wanted me and you, he chose us. We weren't seeking after him. He sought after us and he even knocked Paul off the horse, but he even knocked us off our high horses too. And he, he chose us. He wanted us. And in Revelations 4.11, for your pleasure, he created us. For his pleasure, he did that. 
And in Psalms 149, verse 4, God takes pleasure in his creation. He takes pleasure in us. Listen to that. That's exciting. God gets pleasure in watching me and you. Being just, being just him actually, being, and I, I'm sorry, let me back up a little. I'm getting ahead of myself. When my son, and this is a natural example, but when my, when my son was young, I used to go in the room, my husband and I used to do the same thing, just to watch him breathe because we so loved him. He wasn't quoting scriptures. He wasn't doing what exactly what we wanted him to do. Yeah, he was. He was sleeping. We were getting a break, so let me correct that. But I mean, he was sleeping, just being who Herbie was being. He was just being a young boy. And we took pleasure in watching him. We were grateful for him. How much more is it God like that for us? Sometimes we think we got to perform perform for God to love us. No, we don't. God just loves us because we breathe. He loves us. He is not this judgmental God who we have to do everything right or he's going to like smack us in the head. I mean, we may could be like that, but we're, we're um, made in the image of God. He's not made in the image of us. And so, it's, and so in Psalms 149, 4, God takes pleasure in his creation. He takes pleasure in you and I. God get, get, takes pleasure in just watching us. And in Ephesians 1, 4, it talks about focus. His love, we can focus, God focuses his love on us. And that's in Ephesians 1, 4, I'm sorry. He gave us the ability to love him back. God gave us the ability to love him back. God gave us the freedom of choice. God planned for me. God's plan for me and for you is his pleasure. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and love your neighbor. And in Hosea 6.6, 6, know, know God and love him. Know God and know to know God is to love him. I, I was planned for God's pleasure. I was planned. We were planned for God's pleasure. God sent us here for, for his pleasure. The purpose of life, know God and, and love God. Know God and love God. How do you know you're disconnected from God? How do you, how do you know? Because you can say, I love God. And, you know, we can say all of that. We can say that. But how do we know if we're disconnected from that love? Listen to this worry. If you're worrying, you're not loving God at the same time. You can't do both. You can't do both. You're either worrying or you're loving God because God's perfect love delivers us from the fear of worry. If it's to be, it's up to me. You know that saying, if it's to be, it's up to me. And so if I don't do it, um, you know, it's not going to get done. Come on, please cut that. Please cut that. Um, God loves us so much. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. And the perfect love of God um, disconnects us from fear. God formed me. For he, God formed you and me for his family. God wanted a family, so he formed us. He, he formed a galaxy of, of a love family. And so, so our family here on earth, we'll, we won't all, always have it. They will, we won't always be here on earth as, as, as a family. I mean, our family is those who do the will of God. God gave us a family here on earth to work out things, to work out our salvation, to work things out. God gave us that. But that's going to end. It's not going to always be. But our eternal family will, be, will, will take place for eternity. And so we're practicing. We have our family. God put things in place. And we're working out our salvation, working out our salvation with what God has set before us. But our, our heavenly family is forever. It's eternal. And so in 1 Peter 2.17, this life is preparation for the next life. So we learn how to worship here. We learn how to love God. Learn to, we learn how to love others. This is, the laboratory, this is the laboratory here on earth for learning how to love. Learning to love the unlovable. You don't learn how to love just by being around people that love you. You don't. Real people, real people with real people, not ideal people. So we learn how to love. In this place, this boot camp, we learn how to love by being sometimes around unlovable people. Love is a choice. In Romans 12, 15, we won't make it without people. We need people. God created us to become like Christ. Grow up spiritually. 
and to grow up spiritually. Jesus Christ is the only perfect person. What you do rather than what you become. What you do rather than what you become. Because that addresses your character. And your character is what God, God how, we, how we're honed and, and nourished and, and how we develop our character is what, what's important to God. You're not taking your stuff or your career to heaven. You're only taking your character with you. None of your accomplishments, whether you have degrees or rather whatever you have, none of that stuff you're taking to heaven with you. The thing that you will take is your character, the thing that you're allowing God to work together with. And in Romans 8, 29, not interested, God is not interested in what you do, but who you are, your character. Not God, we're not gods, but God is training us to be godly. So why do we question things in life? Is it to make you, why, why question, why questions in life is to make you more like Jesus? Why is this happening? I'm, I'm sorry, I lost my, lost my place. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Why is this going on? And we have things that, that go on in our life and we're like, why is this happening to me? If God is so good, why is it happening? Because in those things that we go through in our life, whether it's with our kids, in our marriage, in our bodies, with financially, whatever it is, that's the place where God teaches us how to develop our character and how we, we learn more about him because it should bring us into his presence to say, God, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening here? This is the training ground for us. This is the boot camp. So in boot camp, when, when, a, when a person is in the armed forces and they're in boot camp, they're not asking the person who is training them, why you have me going through this mud? Why you have me doing certain things? It's boot camp. That's where you get toughened up. This is our boot camp. This is where our character is developed for the other side because this place is not our home. We're home. We're being developed for another place. Yes, we are. So love is a choice. Love is a choice. We're, God teaches us to love hard people. We want to just love people who are lovable and God teaches us in the trenches how to love. The things that we're going that's going on in our life, we get so engulfed in, you know, how we look to other people, how we look to other people, how do our kids look to other people? How does our how do our finances look to other people? How do we look to other people? We get so involved in that kind of stuff. And none of that stuff is going to matter in heaven because this place is where God is training us to live in heaven. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our home and this place is not. This is where the battleground is where we're being trained to live in another place. And so we look at the word joy. We say the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy is internal and eternal. Joy is internal and eternal. How do we, how do we learn about joy? We can talk about joy, but joy, we learn about joy, right? Dead smack in the middle of grief. That's how we learn about joy. So we learn about the things of God in the middle of situations. We have no backbones if everything was just smooth sailing. We got everything we wanted it when we wanted. And we tell people, I'm going to get this tomorrow and we get it. I'm going to get that the next day and we get I mean, we really don't develop backbone. We just get what we get. I mean, that's like having a spoiled child. A spoiled child, we can render them useless. They have no backbones if we're careful. If we're, if, and God knew that. That's why he doesn't do that with us. So joy, we talk about the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we talk about joy and we sing about joy. But how does joy develop in our lives? Right? Dead smack in the middle of grief. How does, how does patience develop in our lives? How does God teach us about patience? Right? Dead smack in the middle of chaos. That's how we learn about. Um, that's how we learn about patience. Listen to this. God hears you. Whether you are shouting praises of thanksgiving, crying tears of mourning, or singing phrases of glory, God hears. He listens. He does not abandon or, or ignore us. He hears our voice. He hears your heart. He hears your shouts. He hears your whispers. He hears your thoughts. God loves speaking to us. He loves um, conversing with us. Sometimes this seems scary. We feel like we're, we, we sometimes we feel like we have to perform, but we don't. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Do not believe it. God takes us as we are. We 
where we are. We don't have to filter, pretend, or please God in the flesh. He meets us, loves us, accept, accepts us right where we are, are at the moment. I love the Lord for I heard, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. And that's in Romans 1 16, um, 1 through 7. Do not believe, do, do, you, do you believe God hears you and that he speaks to you? Do you? Do you believe that God hears you and he speaks to you? What he does and God, God is speaking this to you today because he wants to work together with you to hone in your ear to hear his voice so that, you, so that you're not hitting and missing that you, you said God spoke to you 200 times, but he, but he only spoke to you one time that you heard. So God wants to, God wants to change your trajectory of that. And so there is a war going on right now and right in front of you, a deep, big, all out battle for you and for your heart and for your ear. The war is raging, has been sent. It was sent to you when you were born. There was one there is one that desires goodness for you. There is one that loves you unconditionally and wants you to become who he designed you to be. There is one that has sacrificed for you. He died for you. He bled for you. There is one that not only takes but also gives away freely. There is one that calls you his daughter and his son, that calls you his beloved. Do not let the other one win. Do not give in. Instead, look up. Listen for his voice. Stop in and sit in silence. Listen to the truth whispered in your heart. Let it go deep inside of you. Let it settle. You are loved. I love you, says the Lord, without fail, without borders. There is nothing you can do to separate yourself from my love. I'm yours forever. Be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith, in truth. And the Lord of all grace will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And that's in 1 Peter 5, verse 8 through 10. Do you grasp the spiritual spiritual? warfare that goes on in your life and recognize it for what it is continue to press in to god and his word and and allow him to to stabilize you with his armor so god wants to speak to us god is speaking to you today that he wants to speak to you he wants your ear to be keen to what he's saying keen to what he's saying so you don't have to justify yourself by saying god spoke to me god spoke yeah god spoke i know god you know we do that sometimes out of fear because we don't real, really think god speaks and so, and so how do you know that because you spend time worrying about things you're angry about things you're upside and you can camouflage it by saying that's just the way i am well you know what we died in christ and the, and and Christ um, died that we might li that He might live through us. So it's no longer I who live; it's Him living through us. And so we have to let Him have full reign and do what He's called us to do. He wants us to hear His voice. He wants us to hear it clearer. And it's important; it's paramount that, especially in these last days, that we are hearing His voice. When God says, "Go to the right, go to the left, go here," stop. Don't say that. Say it. God doesn't want to speak to us the same way he spoke to us when we were four years old and now we're 40 or 45 or 65 or 75. God wants us developing and growing in his grace and his mercy and, and being at peace with his presence with us because his presence is with us to do us good. We didn't make up the, the phrase God speaks to us. We didn't make, we couldn't have come up with that. God put that out here. 
God wants to speak to us. He wants to commune with us. He wants to commune with us more than we want to commune with him. And so, and sometimes we think, and the enemy puts this out, this, oh, God doesn't speak. Oh, it's boring. Oh, let's see. Oh, God speaks to her, but he doesn't speak to me. And sometimes we put it out there like, God speaks to me, but he doesn't speak to you. I mean, we do that in the flesh, but we have to take God's word at his word. I mean, we have to begin to, to let God's word exegesis. We have to speak out of God's word and not speak in, into it what we want to say. You know, God spoke to us and, and we want to do that eisegesis. We want it to be the, the, our will and what we're saying God said. And God wants to speak out of us. God's word is true. God's voice is clear. He wants it to be clearer and clearer to us. We're in the training grounds. We're in the battlefield where God wants to speak to us. This is where we're being trained. We're not to lose hope. We're not to give up. We don't have to make up stuff. We don't have to hold on to a form of godliness, even though we deny its power. How do we know we deny its power? Because we worry. And you can look at somebody else and say, oh, they're not walking with God. But my question to you is, how much do you worry? Because worrying is essentially saying you're functioning out of the same spirit as an atheist. Because an atheist says there is no God. When you worry, you say, I have to do it myself. There is no God. If I don't do it, it's not going to get done. That's the same spirit that an atheist that, we, that we've judged from time to time. That's the same spirit that they function out of. So what spirit are you going to function out of today? Are you going to trust God? Or are you going to wait and allow God to train you in hearing his voice? And we learn that training, not just by being by ourselves. I mean, God has put us in a body. And, you know, like I said earlier, our, our, our natural family that God has blessed us with, they're not going to always be amongst us. They're not. We're going to die, they're going to die off. Some will leave and get married. Some, you know, different things are going to happen. But our eternal family, those who are born of God, will go, will go on trillions and trillions of years. If we live here for, for 85 years, if we live here for, for 125 years, that's a small portion of living trillions and trillions of years. That's a small, that's like a minute portion of living for all eternity. And so uh, let's allow God to train us. Let's talk about it. Let's sing about it. Let's ask questions. Let's practice walking with God, practice listening to his voice. Let's do that. But you can't do it by yourself because if you're just by yourself and you're just training yourself and it doesn't have to be tested and tried. I mean, really, I mean, really what word, what scripture are you basing that on? We need one another. We need one another. We need one another. God has positioned us in different positions so that we can help one another, so we can help one another walk this thing out. God wants us to hear his voice. And us hearing God's voice is not just to say, I heard God's voice. You know, because sometimes we just make it like, I heard God's voice and you didn't. I heard God's voice. I mean, that's nice. And we're excited. We want to give ourselves a high five when we hear God's voice. We, I mean, God, I get that. I get it. God gets that. But God has a purpose for everything. Every star he put in the sky, the moon he put in the sky, the green grass, everything God creates, he creates it for a purpose. So let's go in more with why God speaks to us, why God wants to speak to us. Because sometimes we think God just wants to speak to us because he just wants us to prophesy or he wants us to give somebody else a word or he wants us, it's for somebody else. The, no, God speaks to us for us first. We need to know that, that God has a purpose and he's speaking to us and the direction he wants to take us in and what he wants to do. So it's generally for us first because there are some things on the inside of us that God wants to put in and there are things that God wants to take out. So we don't have to make up stuff. We don't have to help God out. His word stands alone. It can stand by itself. He doesn't need us to help him in that way. Actually, God doesn't need us. I hope that doesn't hurt your feeling. God doesn't need us. He chose us deliberately to be in his family for all eternity. So not just here on earth. This is the shortest period of our life. And so, you know, don't get all hung up in what, what only takes place here because you are being prepared to live in another place. No, if you don't like worship down here, you need to change your mind because we're going to be worshiping all day and all night in heaven. So, so there are certain things in our character 
that God needs to adjust because he loves us. He's preparing us to live with him forever. He's preparing us. And so that's why the woman in the Bible, she was like, she got a glimpse of that. She was like, oh, okay, um, in the next kingdom, can my sons be on the right and the left? Because she knew that what was on the other side was more important than what was here. And so we need to know that too. We need to know that our character is what will stand in the last days and what we will take to heaven with us. You're not going to take your Mercedes, your Bentley. You're not going to take, I mean, even in heaven, and this used to bother me years ago when I realized when I was first married to my husband that in heaven, we're not going to be married. That bothered me. It was like, really? No, we're going to be the brother. God brought us together in marriage because he wanted things worked out in us and through us. And so my husband's on the other side. I'm seeing her on earth because there are things God want to use me for, want to work out in me. And so this is the battleground. This is the training ground for what, what, what God is bringing me into and what he's bringing you into. So let's seek God concerning his voice because we've made his voice so natural and earthly and sometimes to the point of being demonic. And God has so much for us in hearing his voice other than just saying, I heard God spoke to me. God said this to me. I mean, that's a part of it, but it's so much more than just that level of this thing. And so, God, Father God, I thank you. That I thank you this morning for your children hearing your word and hear and heeding to your voice. Your voice. I thank you for intensifying our ear to hear your voice, and that we're not just hearing your voice. We're not just hearing it so we can say we heard it. But we want, want to move accordingly. We want to know the purpose that you have us hearing your voice, Father, so we can function in that. We got a glim glimpse of your ca our character is what you want to adjust. You want to adjust our character so that we're reigning appropriately here on earth and when we get to heaven. Because this place is truly not our, our, our home, not just in words, but in reality. So, Father, thank you so much for choosing us. Thank you so, so much for speaking to us. And Father, we are listening intently to what you're saying to us in these days to come because a lot of our speech is going to change. A lot is going to change. A lot of repentance is going to take place. Not repentance in hell, you're going to hell or heaven. We're already in this thing. If you're born again, we're already going to heaven. Now God is working together with us, adjusting us and causing us to reign together with him. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast today as much as I did. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I am looking forward to what God will speak to us during these days to come. You know, until we meet again, until we meet next week, God will speak to us. Because God always, when, he, when God speaks his word, you hear me saying this a lot, when God speaks his word, he always thrusts us into situations where that word is tested. Because you heard the word today, even though you may have been saying, amen, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, that doesn't mean you have it. That means you agree for God to work together so he can cause this thing to work in you so it, it's a part of you, so that it changes your character, so that it changes who your speech, so that it changes the, the atmosphere around you. That, that's why God gives us his word. He gives us his word, and then he thrusts us into situations where that word is worked out in us. Don't you want God's word worked out in you? I do. I want to be more like Christ every day. I want to be more. I want to come into more and more of him. So sometimes we have to shut our mouth. We, we, like he says in James, we have to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Why did he say that? Because sometimes we are quick to speak. We do the opposite. We are quick to speak what we think we know, and we are slow to hear. And God wants us to hear because in our hearing, we think that's not active because we, we think the only activity is when we hear ourselves talking and that's active. We're actively involved with God. But sometimes that's the opposite. That's the opposite. I love one thing about my pastor, and I'll just say this real quickly because we're about all. But I love the thing about my pastor because he listens keenly and he can regurgitate what you said. And, and I love that. I, I glean from that. Because that's how God is. That's how God wants us to be. He wants us to listen to one another. He wants us to glean. He doesn't always want us talking over one another and da 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 and I know you know. You know, you know that world. God wants us to hear. He wants us to practice meditating on his word, 
quiet in ourselves so that when he speaks to us in his still voice, we hear him. We hear him speaking to us. And that thrills us. That should thrill us. It thrills me that God chose me to speak to. As messed up and messy as we can be sometimes, God chose us to live with him forever for trillions and trillions of years. So if we live to be 125 years old, that's just a corner, just not, not even maybe a corner of eternity. So, so, so enjoy God training you. Don't just think he's going to train you in the good things. No, God trains us in the messy. We just don't like that it looks messy for people looking in it. But you know what? Everybody got some messy, okay? God didn't call us because we were perfect. He called us knowing that full well that we can be messy from time to time. We try to cover it up, but we all have it. But God trains us in every situation we're in. Ask yourself, ask yourself, God, what are you saying to me in this situation? What are you saying? You're in a situation with your family. And you're saying, God, because I've said before, God, why did you give me this family member? Really? <laughs> really? That's really a stupid response? Really? Because God knows exactly what he's doing. And if God wants to train me in righteousness, he puts us right there smack into a situation where we're being trained. I mean, I'm sure Joseph said the same thing about his brothers. He may have thought it. God, really, you give me these bro brothers who want to kill me? Yes, God did that. God trained him and raised him up into heavenly places like he's doing for us today. So it's not perfect situations that keep us. Know that. It is never perfect situations that keep us. They're not sturdy enough, enough to keep us. It's God who keeps us. God who is rich in mercy and loving kindness and who chose us. That's who keeps us, not your perfect situations that you try to try to portray. Your life is great because you have from time to time a perfect situation. But you know in the back of your in your head that a situation can change quickly. It can go from good to bad and it can go from bad to good in a in a, in a, in in a Minnesota minute. And so it's better to us for us to cling to God, to cling to him and to ride with him and to listen to his voice because God is not out to destroy us. He loves us. He loves you and I, and he has a purpose for everything that he allows us to encounter. He has a purpose for it. So I love you and thank you for joining me on Manna um, from Heaven with your girl, Sharon Gaines Lee, or as some people call me, Shay, whatever you can call me, Shay, or you can call me Sharon Gaines Lee, but one thing the, my father used to say, don't call me late for dinner. Don't call me, don't call me late when it's time for the manna, to, the manna for, for me to be fed with the manna. So I love you and thank you for joining me. And I'll see you again next week on Manna from Heaven. Bye-bye.